Welcome back. You're watching Credlin with Chris Smith. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we started the week celebrating the Queen's birthday honours and finished it with Putin's honours list, or as he calls them, sanctions for pushing a Russophobic agenda. One Aussie who's joined this list is Peter Jennings, Director of Peter Jennings Strategy Consultants and the former head of ASPI. Peter, congratulations. Almost better than an OAM. Thank you, Chris. Well, at least I'm on one list, so that's pretty good news. <laughs> what a silly thing to do. It's almost childish tit-for-tat diplomacy, isn't it? It does look very much like the Russian embassy was given, you know, 45 minutes to put together a list, and it's a fairly <laughs> random collection of people that are there. Uh, I'm pleased to be there because I've actually been pretty critical of the Russian regime uh, during the course of the Ukrainian conflict. But, yes, it, it is just tit for tat. It reflects the fact that Australia has uh, mounted its own sanctions. But our sanctions are against, um, you know, the oligarchs that keep Putin in power, the military that are uh, com commissioning war crimes in Ukraine. In other words, there's a purpose to what uh, Australia is doing. Um, and it just goes to show how in an authoritarian system like Russia, um, you know, the legal system, the police, everything else can simply just be bent to the use of the political leader, Vladimir Putin, and here he's trying to make a point that if Australia can sanction Russians, well, Russians can sanction Australians. You, you write about this 40-minute hurry, uh, hurriedly formulated list because, interestingly, there was only one Australian politician on the list, the new South Australian Premier. Um, however, that, that might soon change after it was revealed that Anthony Albanese has been invited by Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky to visit Kiev when the PM travels to Europe later this month for NATO. I, I would really love to see uh, the Prime Minister take up that offer. I, I think Australia has been uh, a strong supporter of Ukraine. Uh, the previous government surprised me, in fact, by providing military assistance, although I'm delighted that it did. And I think it would be great for Albanese to go there and see firsthand what's needed, because more support is required and Australia should be doing more, including with lethal military aid. So I think great if the Prime Minister goes there. And, Chris, it's also an important reminder to Albanese that Australia's interests are not simply narrow to Asia and the Pacific. We actually have European interests. Mm. And so the fact that uh, Mr Albanese is going to talk to a, a NATO meeting as one of NATO's most important non-NATO partners is a reminder that Australia has global interests um, and we need to be prosecuting those w wherever um, it takes Australia. Peter, the Prime Minister was a bit coy on this offer today. Have a listen to the way he answered a question about it. I'll take appropriate advice. And obviously there are security issues as well um, in terms of, uh, of, of such, such a visit. I appreciate the spirit in which it's been offered. Peter, can you work out why he was so coy there? Because I don't know whether he feels he's being rewarded for what the Morrison government did in helping Ukrainians and their army. Maybe there could be a little bit of that. But He's got to go. You're not going to turn down an offer to go to Kiev. Uh, who, who would not want to be uh, having a photo opportunity with Volodymyr Zelensky? I mean, yeah. he's probably one of the most popular politicians on the face of the planet right now. What Mr Albanese needs to do is not take advice. He needs to take a decision. Yeah. And the obvious decision is to go and provide that support to the people of Ukraine. I, I think it would be a, a terrible uh, step backwards if he didn't do that. And and really, you know, Australia, as, as a meaningful, um, consequential democracy in the world, we need to be stepping forward and doing our bit. And, and that means that uh, Anthony Albanese should go. And he will be every bit as secure as Boris Johnson, uh, the French, German and Italian Prime Ministers, and many, many, many other European leaders that have now visited Kiev. Yes. I, I want to move to another international issue facing the current Australian government, what to do with the port of Darwin. You wrote in The Australian this week that Labor should be encouraged to cancel the port of Darwin lease to the Chinese as part of its strategy with China. Why do we need to tear this up? I think this is becoming increasingly important because of the dire state of security in the Indo-Pacific region, which is making northern Australia more and more important, and not just to us, uh, Chris, but to our allies, to the United States, to Japan... Uh, and, you know, here we have the consequences of a really dreadful decision from just a handful of years ago to lease 
the only significant strategic port in the northern half of the country to a Chinese com company for, for 99 years. So, I, uh, you know, I agree with your earlier comment. I, I don't really know why another review needs to be done. Mm. Uh, another decision is what's required. Uh, and I can tell you, if Anthony Albanese hands this back to the Defence Department, we'll get the same lack of response from them as the Morrison government did a few months ago. So what Albanese needs to do is either have it done uh, reviewed independently, let's take the views of our allies into account and start to think in broader terms about our security interests, or maybe we just don't bother with the review at all and do what I think is Albanese's instinct, which is that he thinks it's not in Australia's security interest to have this port lease. In which case, let's take it back and start building up some significant defence capability in the north of the country. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we've learned today that part of the Labor government's China strategy will be to differentiate between the Communist Party of China and Chinese Australians. Do you think this was an issue for the coalition at the federal election? Do we need to be, I guess, a little bit more nuanced in the way we voice our distrust and our criticism of Beijing? I, I think this criticism of the previous government can be overstated. I, I think most people understand that there is a difference between the Communist Party uh, and the people of China. But, you know, this, this is a distinction that's important to retain. Uh, you know, in my own writing uh, and, and when I'm speaking to the media, Chris, I do try to talk about the Chinese Communist Party or Beijing or the People's Republic of China rather than just broadening it into something which the Communist Party can itself use as being an implicit criticism of their own people. So, yes, it's important to be careful with the language. OK. Peter Jennings, always great to get your analysis on Credlin. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Chris.